British Columbia's lower mainland. It's an amazing coastal journey from the contours of the Fraser Canyon to the open waters of the Pacific. Tracing British Columbia's rich heritage. Queen Victoria didn't want to lose this territory. Exploring an incredible array of urban coastal sea life. Most of the animals are harbor seals, and most of those guys are actually less than five days old. And breathtaking structures built into this natural landscape. Everyone has a different experience. Some people have described it as bungee walking. Now, we reveal the coastlines like never before unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. Canada, over the edge. inland, British Columbia's Fraser River continues its trajectory towards the open sea. This is Hell's Gate a dangerous stretch of Fraser Rapids. Here, 760 million liters of water a minute is forced through a narrow opening in the jagged banks of the river. Beyond Hell's Gate, the walls of the Fraser Canyon soar a kilometer high. It is a unique landscape formed over millions of years. With the waters of the Fraser slowly etching a winding channel into the rocks of BC's interior plateau. Today, the river rushes through this 80 kilometer stretch of rugged terrain. For centuries, the canyon walls were an obstacle for settlers in connecting Canada coast to coast. In the 1950s and 60s, highway tunnels were blasted to complete the Trans-Canada Highway, creating some of North America's longest tunnels. The railroad legacy goes back even further, blasting through these rock faces 100 years ago. Heading west, rolling hills, valleys, and snow-capped peaks mark the entrance to Sasquatch Provincial Park. It was established in 1969, then a much smaller park, built around a 20-hectare inland fjord. Over time, the park boundaries expanded 
Today, it measures more than 1,200 hectares. It is sparsely populated, a remote natural wonder, featuring birch forests, lakes, and incredible mountain ridges. And it leads to one of the lower mainland's scenic gems. This is Harrison Lake, the largest lake in the region, measuring 250 square kilometers. For half the year, these waters are a spectacular shade of green, caused by mineral-rich glaciers feeding the lake every spring. At the southern end of the lake, the town of Harrison Hot Springs is home to 1,500. A small resort community dating back more than a century. Back to the banks of the river, the walls of the Fraser Canyon recede and the waters widen. These lowlands are known as the Fraser Valley. The Fraser has been a key waterway since the arrival of First Nations peoples thousands of years ago. European exploration began with the Spanish in 1792. Then, explorer Simon Fraser journeyed more than 800 kilometers, mapping the entire river in 1808. The 10th longest river in Canada would eventually be named in his honor. The Fraser was also key during the Fraser River Gold Rush of the 1850s, connecting the Lower Mainland with the northern communities of Hope and Yale. Once considered to be the largest city north of Chicago and west of San Francisco, South, the city of Chilliwack marks the first major populated region of the Lower Mainland. It was incorporated in 1873 after a northern migration during the Gold Rush. The town has exploded in population ever since. Now, home to more than 80,000 people.
Heading east from the city of Chilliwack, miles of scenic farmland lines the banks of the Fraser River. Thirty kilometers to the west, the town of Fort Langley lies below. It holds a deep and rich history for Western Canada. This preserved fortification, also named Fort Langley, was one of the earliest trading posts for the Hudson Bay Company. Fort Langley was first established in 1827, about six kilometers downriver, and then we moved to this location in 1839. The Hudson's Bay Company built Fort Langley for trade with the local First Nations. Uh, the First Nations we were trading with were the Stalo First Nations. The Hudson's Bay Company wanted furs, so the beaver was one of the most sought after furs, and all of these furs were taken and shipped back to England. It would have taken about six months by ship and that would have been all the way down the bottom of South America and back. So it was quite a journey, but the furs were worth it. Well, Fort Langley was a very busy fort. We were a transshipment fort, so we were supplying a lot of the other interior posts up north with supplies. So because we were strategically located on the Fraser River and close to the mouth of the ocean, With the onset of the gold rush in the mid-19th century, Fort Langley took on another role as well, helping to establish a political boundary with the United States. The fort would be the birthplace for the province of British Columbia. In 1858, when they found gold in the Fraser River, you had roughly 30,000 American gold miners that came up from the United States searching for gold in the Fraser River. But of course, at the time, there was no governing body and Queen Victoria was concerned. So to ensure that the Americans would not take over, she declared this area a colony of England. And at that point, she could then set up a government, send over judges to ensure that the territory remained British. So on November 19th, 1858, uh, James Douglas declared BC a colony of England and they did so right here in Fort Langley in the original big house. Fort Langley continued to serve as a key Fraser River stopping point for years, but its location proved too difficult to defend and military leaders would choose nearby New Westminster as the capital for the new colony.
Today, Fort Langley National Historic Site is a window into the past. The storehouses here at the fort are full of plentiful items we would be trading with the local First Nations. We've got costume guides to demonstrate how the Hudson's Bay Company would have packed up the salmon, sent off the cranberries. There's blacksmithing demonstrations, making axe heads, metal tools for trade. There's hands-on activities for kids so people can learn how um, life here at the fort would have been 150 years ago. Heading southwest, the communities of Surrey and Langley lie below. Once considered smaller suburbs of Greater Vancouver, they are now major centers all their own. Beginning in the 1980s and 90s, this region of the Lower Mainland experienced incredible growth with an influx of residents from all over the world. At the community of Douglas, our trajectory shifts west. Far below lies the roadway known as Zero Avenue, running directly along the 49th parallel. separating Douglas, British Columbia from Blaine, Washington. Residents on the left live in the United States, those on the right in Canada. It is part of a complex border system with more than 23,000 vehicles traveling country to country along BC's lower mainland every day. And with two-way trade between BC and Washington State, measuring more than $7 billion annually. And beyond the official border crossing, lies one of the most unique features of the world's longest undefended political border. It is the Peace Arch, a joint provincial and state park straddling the 49th parallel, allowing Canadians and Americans to walk freely on both sides of the border.
But the American connection to the Lower Mainland doesn't stop there. Beyond the city of White Rock and Boundary Bay, a tiny outcrop of land extends just south of the 49th parallel. It is Point Roberts, measuring 12 square kilometers, a unique home for its 1,000 residents. Point Roberts is one of the only locations in the continental United States not physically connected to the rest of the country. Just northwest of Point Roberts, USA, the industrial and transportation hub for the Lower Mainland lies on the horizon. At Tawasset, this artificial island serves as the BC Ferries Terminal, connecting Vancouver with Victoria, Nanaimo, and the Southern Gulf Islands. Just meters away, one of the West Coast's most comprehensive industrial operations works non-stop. This is the West Shore Terminal's coal export facility. It is the largest of its kind in Canada exporting more coal than all other facilities combined. More than 7,000 tons of coal per hour is moved from conveyor belts using massive stacker reclaimers onto the two-ton stockpile. Here it is sprayed and wet down to avoid dust contamination in the area. It is then loaded onto coal barges at more than 4,500 tons per hour. The facility exports more than 25 million tons of coal per year on nearly 300 ships coming and going from this terminal. And it is just part of the overall Greater Vancouver port system. infrastructure consisting of barges, marine terminals, and railways. The port is Canada's largest, the fourth largest in North America. accommodating the world's largest cargo vessels and cruise ships. More than 3,000 vessels pass through each year. Carrying 130 million tons of cargo, worth $75 billion. To 130 countries around the world.
Just north of West Shore Terminals, a familiar skyline lies in the distance. This is the city of Vancouver. Founded in 1886, the city had been explored by Europeans nearly a century earlier and a home for First Nations peoples thousands of years before that. The city is set on the Burrard Peninsula, measuring 114 square kilometers. It is home to 600,000 people, with nearly 2.3 million in the greater metro area. Vancouver's downtown is a maze of modern skyscrapers. And high-rise residential buildings that make Vancouver Canada's most densely populated city. It is also the heart of British Columbia's business sector, with central offices representing Western Canada's natural resources software development, biotech, and aerospace sectors. The waterfront is sheltered and serene. Home to recreational watercraft and float planes. At the northern end of the city lies one of the largest urban parks in North America. Stanley Park is more than 1,000 acres of wilderness. Open for recreation year round. It is hardly a wonder that Vancouver is consistently named the world's most livable city. And it is not just livable for humans. One operation in the heart of this urban waterfront is dedicated to quality of life for the city's marine mammals. We are at the Vancouver Aquarium's Marine Mammal Rescue Centre, which is in the heart of Coal Harbour in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. We are a rehabilitation centre for marine mammals that are found along the coastline of British Columbia. 
We have everything from um, small sea otters that come in to larger cetaceans, say porpoises and dolphins, and everything else in between. The rescue center that we have here for marine mammals is the only rehabilitation center in all of Canada, and actually the largest rehabilitation center in all of Canada for marine mammals, so we're very unique in that sense. Most of the animals that we do treat are harbor seals, and most of those guys are actually less than five days old. So they come into our facility, they are either injured or basically separated from their mums in some sort of way. It's really hard for us to tell, but most of them that do come in are in need of care. It's pupping season here in British Columbia, usually between June and September, so that's when we see an influx of seal pups. It's our jobs to basically um, get them healthy and strong and back out into the wild in the shortest amount of time. So this is our intensive care side of our center. This is where the animals, when they first come in, are placed into their tubs. We do keep them separated for quarantine purposes. A lot of these little guys, that do, when they do come in, have some sort of viral or bacterial infection sometimes, so we want to keep them separate from each other so that the, the other ones don't um, get those certain things. But most of the time when they come in, they are um, just dehydrated and malnourished, so it's up to us to, to be able to, to replenish all those things. Oh boy. Hey, Ty. Tyler. So we do offer these little guys some swims. That's a salt bath. Some of these little ones do have small wounds on them, so it's the best way for us to actually clean the wounds that's quite non-invasive. When they first come in, we start giving them fluid therapy, then we also start giving them nutrition, so we tube feed them five times a day. We are just starting our second tube feed of the day. Uh, most of these guys in here are getting fed five times a day. What Andrew's doing is just pulling up our formula. It's a prefab, um, high fat, high protein formula that kind of mimics the mom's milk. What Tyler does is he restrains the animal, gets him so he's at least comfortable in his hands a bit, and then Andrew's gonna give him the tube. They're gonna place the tube down the esophagus and into the stomach. As you can see, Aztec doesn't necessarily mind this too much, but at the same time, he is a wild animal, so he does struggle a bit. So they don't taste this at all. It basically goes directly into their stomach. It's a fast way for us to be able to give them their nutrition that they do require, while not really handling them too, too much. And there he is. Now he's had his second meal of the day. <laughs> Once they are big enough and strong enough, they get to go into some of our larger pools and socialize and they get conditioned. And then our goal, of course, is to release them back out at that point. small staff here and would not be able to run basically without our large volunteer base. We have over 160 volunteers who are here actually right now 24 hours a day looking after these animals, observing these animals and assisting staff. With all those people combined uh, we we're, we're able to run at a, a high pace that we are. We go through approximately 70 15 pound buckets of formula throughout our June, July, and August and into September too. We do go through a lot of fish and a lot of water with these guys. We go through about 15 tons of herring in a, in a short period of time, so we go through a lot of food here. It's pretty neat for us, I guess you could say, to be able to have the experience and to be able to be so close to some animals that you wouldn't necessarily have the chance to be so close to um, out in the wild. Uh, one of the things that we do here is to try to keep a little bit back from them because of course our goal is to release them, um, but it, sometimes it is pretty hard when you see those cute faces. Our 
our center is required basically within where we are right now in Vancouver and the British Columbia coastline uh, because there is a need. These animals do get separated and oftentimes it is because of humans. So it is our job to be able to rehabilitate them and, and to help out in some sort of way. From Vancouver, we head north across Vancouver Harbor to the shores of North Vancouver. Combined, this city and district are home to 130,000 people. Connected to the city of Vancouver by two bridges, the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge and the spectacular Lionsgate Bridge. And here, in the suburbs of one of Canada's largest cities, a wilderness attraction has been thriving for decades, drawing visitors from around the world. It is the Capilano Suspension Bridge. We're at Capilano Suspension Bridge Park, which is in North Vancouver, British Columbia. Capilano Suspension Bridge Park is one of the oldest attractions in BC and definitely the oldest attraction in Vancouver. In 1888, a Scotsman, who was um, actually a retired civil engineer, decided to buy 6,000 acres. He had a cabin on this side, and he had 3,000 acres on the other side. He built a suspension bridge in 1889, and that was the beginning of Capilano Suspension Bridge. Since that time, there have been various reincarnations of the bridge. The first wire bridge was built in uh, 1903. Another cable was added to that in 1914. The bridge was completely rebuilt in 1953. And then recently a tree fell on the bridge and the cables were rebuilt uh, during that time. But the bridge has always been in the same location. The bridge is held up by 18 ton uh, concrete blocks on either side. The anchors are 18 tons each. The cables on the bridge are pre-stressed to 100,000 pounds, so that's 100,000 pounds per square foot. So it's very solid, it's, ex it's inspected daily. Visitors come from all over the world, and we see almost three quarters of a million visitors a year. Uh, most of our guests are from North America, but we still see a lot from Europe and from Asia. This is our reason for being right here. It's 450 feet long and 230 feet high. Capilano River is, is spawning ground for salmon, so when our guests are here in September and October, you can actually see all the salmon beating their way back home. <laughs> Everyone has a different experience and some are uh, scared by the moving planks and some people have described it as bungee walking, which I think is a great little <laughs> description. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> You're not altogether in control of the steps because as everyone moves across the bridge, the, the bridge itself wobbles. But again, you've got cables either side to hold on to, you've got beautiful views to look at, you've got a gorgeous river, so it's really a wonderful experience. In the earlier days, there was only a bridge here and there was always acreage around the bridge. So since 1983, the owner has been addressing questions that our guests ask, like what are the trees that we're seeing? What's the vegetation? And so step by step, we've added to the park. Now 
now we have seven suspension bridges through the trees on the other side. It uh, is sort of like a squirrel's playground. Uh, you're in the mid-story of these evergreens. Treetops Adventure was built in 2004. The beauty of it is anyone can do it. It begins at the tree house, which is just up there. It takes about 12 steps to get to the tree, up to the tree house. And then you go on seven suspension bridges through the trees. As the ground slopes away, you get higher and higher, even though you're really going on fairly level suspension bridges. The trees that are supporting Treetops Adventure are Douglas fir trees. They're about 250 to 300 years old, and they weigh about 30 or 40 tons each. Just last year, our newest attraction, Cliff Walk, opened. And the vegetation along the canyon is very interesting, and it changes. This next area of Cliff Walk takes us through some amazing vegetation, and what's most amazing is how the trees cling to the granite cliffs. It is incredible that for hundreds of years, they will cling to these cliffs with hardly any place to go. It's an area that guests have not been able to get to, so when it was designed, it was quite tricky to design it. And so it took four years to build. The whole structure is hung from 12 anchor points along the canyon. It's a beautiful walk in an unexplored area of our park. If there's a trend developing in how we are moving forward is we want to do environmentally friendly things. In the case of Treetops Adventure, it is very different from other canopy walks in the world and it was the first one that was built without a single nail in the tree. The collars are, are suspended around the tree much like an umbrella. When we built Cliff Walk, it was the same idea. Nothing had been hung off the cliff quite like this with the 12 anchor points. So they're leading edge in technology and innovation, but they're still preserving the environment and taking the guests through the environment that they came here to see. I think um, our mandate is clear that we want to preserve this area and, and make sure that it, it doesn't change and that anything we do enhances this area. Anything we do going forward will be very ecologically friendly. We do want to entertain our guests. We'll continue to do that in new and thrilling ways. Continuing north, city and suburbs slowly disappear on approach to the incredible mountainous landscape surrounding the city. Towering more than 1,200 meters high, Grouse Mountain is an iconic landmark. It is an alpine ski destination in the winter and a haven for explorers in the summer. The first lodge and official hiking trail was built in the 1920s. In the 1940s, a double chairlift was installed, said to be the first of its kind in the world. Finally, Grouse Mountain's famous aerial tramway was opened in 1966, carrying tourists to the summit from the valley below and offering unparalleled vistas of the city.
further north, the mountains continue to rise. Crown Mountain stands 1,500 meters tall. It is one of the most recognizable peaks in the region. Further, Goat Ridge is even higher. Despite rough terrain and steep inclines, these peaks are still popular with adventurers. Seeking refuge from the city, seemingly so far away. from the rugged Fraser Canyon and the churning waters of Hell's Gate. To the skyscrapers and scenery of the coastal city of Vancouver. and the mountainous peaks and valleys of the North Shore landscape. British Columbia's lower mainland is a unique mix of all the West Coast has to offer. Building on generations of history, this region boasts an incredible future. In its wildlife, its culture, its landscape. Here on the edge of Canada.